بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وأصحاب الجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله we praise Allah in all conditions we thank Allah for granting us our health and an opportunity for us to once again engage with the best of creation, with the Sunan of Tiba Nabawi. A recap, Tiba Nabawi refers to the recommendations, tacit approval, the prohibitions that the Prophet ﷺ gave to the Sahaba and by extension to us with relation to health care. He taught us that every aspect of the deen benefits every aspect of our life. He taught us that our acts of ibadat is a benefit for the ruh in the akhirah, but it benefits the physical body. It benefits our minds, and it can be used to assist us with our day-to-day stresses. We mentioned that modern science proves that the human being in this modern world would be faced by many stresses that are fixed. Stresses that affects every part that makes him human. And the world is calling towards natural living, connecting with nature in terms of diet and how we occupy our day-to-day activities. Modern science has shown that when we delve too much into our, our works and the work environment, it takes from our bodies. And in order to rejuvenate, to cleanse us, to purify, to purify us, we have to connect with nature. So scientists in, in many fields are designing lifestyle programs. And often we find that the best lifestyle programs is in accordance with the Sunnah. However, when we use the Sunnah as our reference point, and we look at it through the scientific lens, we see a flawless lifestyle program. So we remind us that Hudu, Salah, Dhikr, reading Quran and all the acts of Ibadah is there for the purpose of our creation and that is to worship Allah. However, when we do that according to the Sunnah, we find these added benefits. These benefits for the physical body, for our minds, everything that our bodies and our cells and the, our digestions, the digestive system, the muscle skeletal system, every part that makes us human, Every part that needs to be replenished finds us through the acts of Ibadah if only we know, if only we look with, with the bigger lens. We don't view Ibadah as something for the Akhirah only. We don't place it in a religious context only. So we live our rest of our lives and we come to the Masjid for our religion. In fact, if we act and live like the Sahaba, Samirna wa Ata'ana, we'll find that the Ibadah becomes our entire lifestyle. So the topic today is hydrotherapy. Hydro refers to water and therapy healing. So healing with water. We start to for the ayah of the Quran, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajim, Bismillah Rahmanir Rahim, wa ja'alna min al ma'i kulli shay'in hay, afala yu'minun. Allah says that we have created everything from water. Will they not believe? A rhetorical question. So while today it's a, it's a scientific fact that everything is made of water, 1400 years ago, it was difficult for the Arabs to conceive that the desert sand had water in it or the driest mountains had water in it. However, because of their belief, they, they accepted what the Quran said. So they used water for healing. They respected water. They understood that in water, through the Qur'an and the Sunnah, they will find much more than just a cleansing agent or something to quench the thirst. So water is recognized as that most essential element that sustains life. It nourishes and purifies all of creation. Every biochemical process in the body requires water to work optimally. And we find throughout the Qur'an, Allah describes Jannah through water. Okay, and we are also 
one of our highest aspirations is to drink from the pond of Kauthar. So Jannah is described through water. We know the entire earth is made up of three quarters water. The human body, we are made of more than 70% water. When we are born, children are born in a water environment within the mother's womb. They are naturally inclined to water. Allah describe, describes his risk that he sends to the earth via water. We find we are drawn to water sports like swimming and surfing. And it's a natural thing that people love to be in water. So hydrotherapy refers to the use of water internally or externally for the treatment of disease or for injury, dysfunction. Hydrothermal therapy refers to the use of water at different temperatures. So, for instance, a hot bath can soothe muscle pain. A sauna can help detox the body through the pores. Wraps can be used at different temperatures to improve blood circulation, to improve healing of ligaments and tendons, as well as packs. So we said water is the basic element of life. Of life. It can be cooling, heating. When you use heated water, it takes away the cold from the body, it increases blood circulation, it opens up the blood vessels. It can cause a feeling of sedation, meaning it relaxes the body, it soothes stiff muscles. When you use cold water, it can revitalize you. It uh, reduces swelling. So water has been used for centuries. And because the Muslims had a close connection to water, we find it transformed their lives. In the past, we find wherever the Muslim empire went, there was a certain model that caused the rest of the world to, to marvel. They marveled at the Muslims. We find that diseases stopped at the borders of the Islamic empire simply due to the health practices of Hudu and Husserl. And the daily health practice, it actually fend off diseases. And from there, the Muslims developed hydrotherapy. So there before we find the popular Turkish baths, the use of jacuzzis, what they call aquatic rehabilitation, where water can be used to improve joint pain. So if you suffer from rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, the problem is that the joint undergoes a lot of wear and tear due to weight. But when you use a heated pool, the hydrostatic pressure in the pool supports your muscles. So you can actually walk in that pool, strengthening the surrounding joint without the burden of the weight because water supports. So there's so many applications of water. But let's look at the, look at the ahadith. We find to, oh, the opening ahadith, Prophet Hassan mentioned that purity is half of faith, a very significant statement. The iman that we rely upon to grant us entry into Jannah, the Prophet Hassan said that half of that is reliant on your purification. Meaning what you do with your physical body accounts for half of your belief. And we find often Allah and His Rasul connects purification of the body to the purification of the soul. Allah says that if you purify your body, He will purify us. And there's various ahadith in Quran ayat where Allah says, Inna Allah yuhibbu tawwabin wa yuhibbu mutatahirin That Allah loves the one who repent and he loves the one who purifies. So like we repent from sins that is harmful and filth, if we purify our bodies, we are also loved by Allah. And there's various other verses that support this. So the use of water for a Muslim is very significant. And the objective of this presentation is for us to appreciate the vastness that water can present in our lives, as opposed to it's just a dust to make quick. We should appreciate it in terms of hydrotherapy. It, it presents another way of connecting to nature and we'll go through each step by step. So we find that the Prophet has a perfect healthcare system in the way he conducted himself. The Prophet mentioned that the fitrah of the prophets are ten things and he mentioned the clipping of the nails, cutting of the moustache, the shaving of the pubic hairs, washing the hands properly, and the list goes on. And everything that he points out can improve your immune system. Why? Because it fights off bacteria. It ensures that the bacteria stays away from the body. The miswak. The miswak is undoubtedly 
better than any modern day toothbrush because it within itself it acts as a floss, as a cleanser, and within, within the bristles you find the best, um, to, best toothpaste known to man. The glass also the, the use of utter, the use of oils. So we know that everything in Islam begins with a niyyah. The Prophet also said that any action devoid of saying Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim or devoid of Allah's name is devoid of barakah. So in the scientific world we find that this concept is also appreciated. And I want to refer to one scientist, his name is Dr. Emoto, a Japanese scientist. He looks at the effect that intentions and words have on water. When we speak to each other, it has an effect. And he conducted scientific experiments. In order to understand a bit about the experiment, we have to look at the structure of water. If you look at water, we see water is known chemically as H2O. Two hydrogen molecules, one oxygen molecule. So depending on how these molecules come together, if they are structured, they assume a frozen state. Water would be a bit destructured, so it's fluid. And when we heat up water, the molecules spread apart, so it becomes vapor. So we conducted a scientific research, a study on what words, thoughts, and intention has on water. So he got different people together to recite certain things over water. When pure things were recited over water, so good words, the words like love and prayer was constantly recited over water, they would freeze the water and they would analyze the water under a microscope. And according to his study, he found that the water molecules assumed a perfect design. When harsh words were, were recited over water, the design became disfigured. And he done the study over and over. And he saw that when prayer is used, and he used prayer from all religions, because all religions has a similar thread in that it's, it's positive. You pray to a higher creator, you're seeking help, you want to be better, and because the intention is good, when you utter it, it has an effect on the water. And he showed that before prayer, water looks a certain way, especially polluted water. Polluted water, the molecules are more disfigured than unpolluted water. And after prayer, the molecules assume the better organization. He done the study on rice as well. He saw that when bad words are this, are, are, are recited over rice, it decomposed quicker. So this concept is not, not far-fetched from Islam. As we know, the concept of reciting, when we enter the homes, you recite Bismillah, the entire space changes. What is uttered in the mouth, you can change in environment. When you eat food, what gets uttered on the food changes. We know individuals in our community that because of their piety, if they were to recite over injured part, for some reason, it gets better. So definitely a, an intention that we have, a can project. He's done the study on different water around the world. And one statement he made was that the only water that didn't require any recitation in order for the molecules to be perfect was the water of Zamzam. And he has a chapter in his book describing this water that he finds so amazing. So the question is, if our intentions and what we say has effect on water, what effect does our words have on each other if we are made of more than 70% water? So the concept of the sunnah, which is to promote mahabba and, and positivity amongst people, can be more appreciated. Prophet Sam spoke about the importance of a good word on somebody. And we say that Tiba Nabawi recognizes that everything in this dunya can be used as a healing, even a good word. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, said that some people become better simply due to the good nature of the physician. So some doctors, or even people in the community, not, they don't have access to medicine, they don't know medicine, but their nature is healing. So sitting in their company does something for your worries, for your pains. So Tiba Nabui recognizes all these subtleties. And the aim of Tiba Nabui is to revive these subtleties in our life. 
our, our fast-paced lifestyle takes away these realities. So we're looking for healing in big things, in actual fact, as you're sitting here, there's healing in this masjid. The individual that you're sitting next to, the scent of the attar. So understand that the deen of Islam presents much more than meets the eye. And if we look through the deen, through the scientific lens, we get a small aspect of what it is. But we don't rely on science. Science gives us that better appreciation. But ultimately we want to be like the Sahaba who said, Sami'na wa ta'ana. So to appreciate the effects of water further, we have to look at what happens in our environment. Microbes. As you're sitting here, there are microbes floating in the air that you cannot see, but it can cause disease. They're present all over, on the desk, on the laptop. And I remember in my first microbiology class, we had to do an experiment where we took a swab and we had to take certain areas, swab it and place it in a, in a dish and we grew it on what they call agar plates. Two weeks later, we look at the plates and see which area of the classroom had the biggest microbes. Which area would you think? So we took a swab of the desk, of the floor. Some of us went to the toilet, we took the swab of the toilet floor, the inside of the brim. Where was the most disease-causing agents? Where would you think? On our desk. Because the toilet flushes all the time, so it's washing away. But how often do we wipe the desk? And new studies have shown that the most dirtiest surface would be the keyboard, your iPhones, touch screen technology, because you never ever clean your screens. So studies have been done on the human body. Every square centimeter on your skin has hundreds and thousands of disease-causing bacteria. There are some bacteria that's good for you and some very harmful. And studies have shown that when you wash your hands correctly, you can actually prevent diseases from spreading. So today, medically, there's big hair, um, campaigns about going about hand washing, correct hand washing. And if you look at, um, at scrubs in surgery, you'll see when they scrub, it mimics the fiqh of wudu. When the Prophet taught us on how to wash their hands properly, they, 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 they scrub and they go beyond the elbows and they wash vigorously. And what's very significant, the one hadith the Prophet said that when you perform a correct wudu, the sins leave the body even from beneath the fingernails. This is very significant because we know that we're supposed to wash so correctly that we get under the fingernails. So under the fingernails is a place that harbors disease, but it's also connected to sins that leaves the body. So the entire deen promotes holistic cleansingness, uh, holistic cleansing. So it's cleansing of the ruh and the body at the same time. Studies has done on those people that perform wudu correctly. If you wash your hands according to the sunnah, you will find that over 90% of the germs that accumulate in your hands would be removed. <coughs> if you look at the mouth, the mouth is one of the most dangerous places on earth because it harbors so much bacteria. Bacteria can grow excessively in the mouth, especially when we have a diet that's so high in carbohydrates, the modern Western diet carbohydrates and burgers and we find that when you rinse the mouth correctly, modern science has shown that rinsing the mouth correctly can fend off gum disease, throat disease and infections as well as ulcers. Mouth rinsing gargling also strengthens the facial muscles which contributes to redu reduction of muscle tension. So when we stress we, we tend to bite but if you gargle your mouth throughout the day, you relax these muscles. And when that muscles are relaxed constantly, it keeps the face looking fresh and radiant. So when you put effort into that wudu, it has an effect on the face. There's certain individuals that you'll see their face close all the time. If you ask them about their day-to-day habits, they'll tell you that they're very precise on the wudu. If you look at the nostrils, What's the purpose of nose hairs? <coughs> Definitely not that. The purpose of nose hairs is to trap dust, pollen, bacteria. But once it traps the pollen, the dust, and the bacteria, what happens then? If you never ever rinse your nose in, in a day, 
It means when you go sleep at night, you're inhaling all of that bacteria, leading to sinus congestion, hay fever, the list goes on. So studies were done on noses, Muslim noses. Those that perform or do according to the sunnah, those that are haphazard and those that leave it out. And it showed that those people that leave out the nostril area have the most bacteria present. So when the bacteria stays there for a while, it causes mucus congestion. When it stays there longer, it goes down to the throat, it can cause tonsillitis. And if it stays longer, it can go to the heart, into the heart valves. So what happens is when you study a bit of fiqh and you just learn a bit more, you find, on, find out that you have different arkans and shuruts and the, the wudu is separated into the faraid and the sunnan. And if you only wash the faraid, your wudu is valid. However, if you look at the sunnan, which happens to be the mouth, the nose and the ears, these are all the entry points of bacteria into the body. So when you look after the sunnan, that's the beauty of wudu. You are improving your immune system. So when you look for the shortcut, you are cutting benefits that can, that can improve your health. And you are cutting out on possible rewards. If you look in the facial region, massage of the face triggers certain pressure points on the face. There are certain points, according to natural medicine, that if you press, you can relieve congestion, you can relieve tension. So by massaging your face, in other words, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that when you perform wudu, make sure that it covers the entire face and it reaches as far as the beard. And you do it vigorously. It can remove tension. Also, look at the wudu in context of your day-to-day -day living. You're busy at work, whether you're a panel beater, a mechanic under a car, whether you're in the office environment, a teacher, whatever you're doing, when you indulge in that activity for too long, it has an effect on the body. When you break away from the Dhuhr Salah, it revitalizes you, it refreshes you. So think of it in that context. So washing the face removes a lot of tension from the muscles, it stimulates acupressure points which can combat headaches, it can assist in relieving acne because it cleanses the skin, it helps with a, a dull complexion. Because wherever you massage, you increase blood supply. When it comes to the arms, washing the arms facilitates a type of massage. So wherever blood flows properly, it brings oxygen to the cells and the organs and the muscles in that area. But at the same time, it takes away waste. So where blood flows well, wherever blood goes, healing goes. Where blood stops, we find that it leads to disease. So massaging the arms facilitates good blood flow. It also washes the arms of any debris that's sitting on the pores on the arms. The lymphatic system is a system of the body that is designed to take away bacteria and move it to the nodes. Those little round circles are nodes. But the lymphatic system doesn't have a pump. The, the circulatory system has a pump. So the lymphatic system requires mu muscle movement in order to work properly. So when you massage, you're actually moving bacteria that accumulates within the channels in the arm towards the armpits. <coughs> and when it goes there, the body neutralizes them. So you have the immune system and white blood cells attacks them and destroys them. Massaging on the, on the forehead also has certain pressure points. And we find what's very significant is that the Prophet ﷺ advised us that when we become angry before wudu, teaching us that wudu is an act of ibadah, but not for salah only. We can use wudu to find emotional healing. So when you look at, if you look at Tiba Nabwi, it describes anger as actually based on the Prophet ﷺ's hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said that anger comes from, sh from shaitan, Shaitan has been created from fire. And fire is extinguished only with water. So when any of you become angry, you should perform wudu. So whilst you're in a state of anger, the body wants to rise, become aggressive, move forward. If you remember this hadith, you can't control your anger. 
So this hadith teaches us that the wudu can be used much more than, than as a prerequisite for salah. We should use it as a resource to put us in a state of calmness. The Prophet also mentioned that before you go sleep before wudu, studies have shown hydrotherapy before sleep reduces, reduces insomnia. So what is insomnia? There's many causes to insomnia. One of the main causes would, would be the, the worriness of the mind. Worrying about our daily activities, about our risk, the day's events, tomorrow's risk. So we lay in bed and contemplate. Instead of using a resource like wudu, which can remove that worry from us, <coughs> if we have the right intention. If you look at the ear, in natural <coughs> medicine, the reflexology, the ear is recognized to stimulate different organs of the body. So when you massage the ear, it can have an effect on certain organs. So if you press on the earlobe, according to reflexology, it affects the eyes, so maybe it will cause you to blink. You can try to do it. It doesn't really work, I'm joking. <laughs> However, according to reflexologists, it affects the, the eyes in some way. Come to the feet, reflexology also recognizes that certain portions of the feet as effects and systems of the body. So when you massage your feet, it can relieve tension because the feet is also symbolic of heavy load, of carrying a heavy load throughout the day, the responsibility that you have, running up and down. So when you massage your feet, you, you're caring for the body, but also you're cleansing yourself for wudu. The Prophet also mentioned that on the day of Qiyamah, my ummah will come with bright faces and limbs because of the traces of wudu. So whosoever is able to increase his brightness, let him do so. Indicating to us that when he perform wudu, the benefit is beyond our comprehension. It will benefit us in the akhirah, and science proves that it will benefit us in the dunya. So the objective of the lesson is to look at this act of ibadah as much more as something that I just need to perform salah. Use it as a resource throughout the day. The next topic that we're going on to would be salah. The postures of the prophets also refer to healing in motion. We mention again that the act of salah, the sole purpose, is to worship Allah. When we do the act according to the sunnah, we accrue many benefits. So in order to appreciate the salah, we have to look at everything around the salah. So you find as human beings, we are, we are constantly affected by changes in our natural environment. We are connected to the universe. We are connected to the sun, to the moon, to the weather, to changes that affect our physiology. Meaning, what happens outside of the body affects every cell in the body. So when we look at the science known as chronobiology, it refers to a study which examines the role that the lunar and solar related systems or rhythms have on human beings, also known as biorhythms. So the changes in the light throughout the day, the changes of the season, causes changes within your body. The baby agrees with me. <laughs> when it comes to nighttime and you want to sleep, you don't merely intend to sleep. Allah allows you to sleep. It's not your music before bedtime, or the paksun chi from the loved one, or the hot chocolate with marshmallows. Allah allows you to sleep. How so? Scientifically, it's proven that we have hormones in the body that secrete it when the sun sets. Hormones refers to chemicals or substances that allows the body to enter a certain phase. <laughs> So throughout the day we have energy hormones. When the sun sets, the photoreceptors in the eyes and the entire body's detection mechanisms picks up that the day is turning into night. And a certain hormone gets secreted known as melatonin, which is the sleep hormone. So this hormone increases in the body and the energy hormone drops. And this hormone brings about the feeling of relaxation. <coughs> and when this hormone reaches a peak, we sleep. 
I see that some people's hormones are high at the moment <laughs> because they're dozing. But it also means that you're close to your shy time. So when this hormone reaches a peak, you sleep. If this hormone doesn't reach a peak, you can't sleep. Speak to somebody that works night shift. He'll tell you all about it. When he comes home, he's tired, but he can't sleep. Why? Because the sun's out. We, the Quran tells us that the day has been designed for your livelihood and the nighttime has been designed for your rest. Not that we must give up our night shift jobs, but it's teaching us that we are in, in total alignment with the day and night cycle. When we go against that, it affects us. So what does the night shift person do? He tries to blot out the sun. So he put black curtains up and he paced everywhere. But his body knows it's daytime. So he doesn't get that quality of sleep. So when you sleep at night and that hormone is high, around about Fajr time, every human being's body knows that the sun is about to rise. Whether you list for Fajr or not, internally your body knows that the sun is going to rise. And that melatonin hormone decreases and the energy hormone starts to rise. So when you're up for Fajr, you are totally in alignment with the physiological energy levels of your body. Therefore, we find that the most productive and successful people on the face of the planet are up at Fajr time. Speak to the Hafid, or the businessman, or the bricklayer, or the foreman. Anybody that wants to do any type of business after Fajr, they are the most productive. For some reason, they work a short amount of time, but they get the most work done. And if you look, look at this famous book, The Seven Traits of the World's Most Successful People, one of the traits is all of them are up at 4 a.m. We're talking about billionaires that had nothing, and they became successful business people because they acknowledged that when you're up early, you get the most out of the day. And the Prophet also taught us that the tools, raka'as of fajr, is worth the entire dunya. Meaning that when you're up for that time, you are the most productive that you can be. If you follow the hadith further, where the Prophet mentions that it's important to sleep straight after Isha, you maximize on that quality of sleep. And when we look into the world of REM sleep, sleep cycles, it shows that there's different phases of sleep throughout the night. The sleep that you get from 11 a.m. to 2 a.m. has the highest quality. If you're in bed that time and you're sleeping, you will get the most deepest quality of sleep. You can never get it anywhere else out of that time. Therefore, if you sleep, the person that sleeps after Isha, naturally they wake up tajit time feeling the need to do something. So fajr is not a problem. So understand that your body innately wants to be up at a time. It's our habits that cause us to make it difficult to get up at a time. But when you align yourself according to what the body wants to do, you become superhuman. Meaning, you become the best you, less fatigued, more productive. The other benefits that happens around about Fajr time also takes place. They speak about a transformation energetically, inwardly, and outwardly. So inside your body, hormones are being stimulated to move you towards energy. In the atmosphere, this change is taking place. In natural medicine, we recognize that everything we can perceive through the senses can heal you. So what you see has a big effect on the matters of the heart and every cell of the body. If you're seeing positive images, it uplifts the soul, but it also heals you. Negative images breaks you down. So the glance of the sun rays after Fajr, the orange and the red in color therapy is seen as stimulating colors. So when the Buddhas come out of Masjid and they walk into their homes, there's an upliftment taking place. There's changes in atmospheric gas. At Fajr time, due to the heat that's available, that's a minimum type of heat and a certain type of light, we find there's a presence of what they call O3 gas. O3 gas has been proven scientifically to have a stimulation or stimulatory effects on the nervous system, which boosts your energy and it puts you in an ideal mental state for work. So therefore you find the Hufad will tell you the best time to learn Hif would be Fajr time. So now you go to work. From 6 to 9 o'clock, the energy hormone is very high. Melatonin is almost non-existent. Except for some people that sleep while they're driving. So at work, between 6 and 9 o'clock, you're the most productive. At Zawal time, every human being has an energy low on the face of the planet. 
because we are connected to the cycle of the universe of the sun and the moon. So when the sun is at its zenith, your energy levels are at its lowest. So if you're sitting in your office environment, and you're busy for hours, and you have a huge deadline, and you think to yourself that Dhuhr time is coming, I don't have enough time, I'm going to skip Dhuhr and make it later tonight, Tarawih. You're fooling yourself because you're pushing your body to a state that it's not designed for. We have not been created to work eight hours a day non-stop. وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ We have been created to worship Allah. So when the rest of our activities moves around our obligations, we find healing in the ibadat. So think about the person in the office environment, sitting over in his computer, slouching more and more. The connection between the brain and the central nervous system is interrupted. There's tension in the shoulders, bad circulation in the legs, the glare of the computer, and he's going on and on. When it's door time, he leaves his computer. When he makes connection with water, he's connecting with the element that he is made up of. If he starts thinking that every aspect of this wudu will benefit me, he will get that. Allah says that he treats his slave the way he thinks of him. So when we have a high perception of our ibadah, it becomes an aspect of our day that we crave for. Because our work is so difficult, we want to make dhuhr now. And therefore we find that all societies around the world, the empire of the Muslims was so great because they looked after the acts of worship. So they were the, the greatest giants, intellectual giants in all sciences. But they made the most ibadah. How is it possible? Because ibadah adds barakah to your life. But when we use our own logic and we think about time, we forget that the deen of Islam puts us into the natural cycle of the universe. We are created on the fitrah. And the, the deen of Islam is that fitrah. It is the natural way. So I spoke about the blood circulation. In order for us to understand and appreciate it a bit better, we have arteries, which is red blood cells, travels through arteries, we have the venous system, the heart pumps blood. Every breath that we take, that oxygen goes onto a red blood cell. The heart moves the cell through the arterial system to every organ of the body. This is with every breath. That blood cell carries nutrients, oxygen, hormones, everything that every part of our body craves. When it gives that to that part, it takes away the waste, which is the blue cell, travels back up to the lungs, and we blow it out as carbon dioxide. So that process, as long as that process is working perfectly, our body organs will work properly. Whatever job you do will cause stagnation of some body organ. When you sit for too long, bend for too long, stand for too long, carry for too long, it exerts pressure on some part of your body. Therefore we find that the salah is performed at five regular intervals throughout the day, which is according to the natural cycle of the universe that's easy on the body, that facilitates correct blood flow. So let's look at each position, the qiyam. So think about the person running up and down, carrying heavy objects. When it comes to salah, when you're standing on the musalla, when you raise your hands, the body feels relieved because the weight is evenly distributed across both feet. So for the first time of the day, you're actually standing still with your weight evenly distributed. So think about our days, running up and down, getting this in the car, acceleration, clutch, taking a turn. Body is un heavy, unbalanced. In your one position already, you are bringing the body to perfect balance. You straighten the back because you're following the sunnah. So your posture is improved. The mind is brought under the control of the intellect as you look at the place of sujood. Your vision is sharpened. You find this further relaxation of the muscles of the lower and upper back. The higher and lower centers of the brain unites for singleness in purpose. So in that one position, you can find calmness if you apply yourself. As you extend the hands, the concentration further is improved. There's further relaxation of the muscles in the legs. And when you begin to recite, you have to understand the concept of sound therapy. That whatever we utter, 
There is an effect on the body. And the Quran is very unique in that every letter of Tajweed, every letter of Mad, every A, E, U, recite, recited in a maqamat or in a melodious fashion has an effect on the body, even without understanding. So when we recite, with understanding it means that the, the understanding can bring consolement to any situation that we have. Our work deadlines, our worry, our risk. In the field of Tazkiyah, it is said that recitation sends vibration which uplifts the heart, the thyroid gland, the pituitary gland, the adrenals, the lungs, purifying them and uplifting them all. So I'm speaking about the physical benefits, emotional benefits, but different ulama in different fields will speak about different benefits. In the field of Tazkiyah, they'll go much deeper. When you perform ruku, according to the Prophet's ruku, the Sahaba described that his back was straight, it was horizontal. If you were to put a glass of water on his back, the glass, the water wouldn't move. If you perform that, that type of ruku, you will find that the muscles of the legs are toned. The muscles of the abdomen are toned. So if your back is straight, you strengthen the abdominal muscles. So if you want a good six pack, perform a good ruku. <laughs> It is also said that over time, this posture improves the personality, creating a sweet kindness and inner harmony. So when you go into Ruku, remember that the blood rushes to the brain, to the lungs, to the upper torso, bringing oxygen, nutrients, hormones, taking away waste products. When you stand up, the blood returns. When the blood returns, it relieves pressure points in your neck, shoulders, the, 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 the trapezius muscle, which are areas of tension. So whenever anybody is stressed, you will know that if you feel the neck muscles, it's very tense. So in one position, you can relieve the muscles and relieve tension. When you go into sujood, we find a perfect sujood means that the knees are at a right angle. The sujood is seen as the ultimate posture of submission and humility. The right angle also allows the muscles to develop so it can prevent flabbiness in the midsection. I'm not saying if you have flabbiness, you're not correct, uh, performing correct sujood. I'm just saying that if you do it correctly, according to anatomy and physiology, the muscles will become more tense. Blood flow increases to the head, the eyes, the ears, the nose. It allows mental toxins, waste products that builds in the brain, to be pulled out of that area. A correct sujood means that it increases elasticity of your joints. It is said that this position gets rid of, of vanity. It's the closest that the, 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 the slave is to his rob. When you perform a second sujood, it would mean that every part of the body would have achieved proper blood circulation. When you sit in the tashahud position, we know according to Imam Shafi'i, the right leg is raised, the right foot is raised, which means that you put pressure on the liver region. Whenever pressure is placed on any organ, it forces blood out of that organ, so it has a detoxifying effect. It forces the contents of the stomach downwards, so it aids digestion. It relaxes the stomach muscles, so it can relieve indigestion problems. So we find today that everybody's looking for the perfect exercise program. But some exercises can be too harsh for the body, some too, too, rela too relaxation, too relaxing for the body. So understand that we're all different. So we shouldn't generalize. When you choose an exercise, do it under medical supervision so that it can be chosen according to what your body can handle. The amazing thing about salah is it is not an exercise. It's an act of ibadah. However, it benefits every part of the body, the joints, the respiratory system, the brain, the digestive system, the muscle skeletal system. And if you were to calculate the different postures in the day, for instance, if you were to just perform your faraid, in one day you'll perform 119 physical postures. In a month, 3,500. Over a year, 42,000. Over 40 years, more than 1 million, close to 2 million postures. 
If you were to go to a sports scientist and say, if I were to do these movements for the rest of my life with using water as hydrotherapy, what would you say about my health? Through the science of natural medicine and sports science, they will tell you that you have a perfect system that is well designed for the body at perfect intervals throughout the day. So understand that our acts of Ibadah prevents, presents holistic healing to us. So your salah, the different positions, is not merely movements that was done by prophets. It is, it is based on the fitrah, on a design that is divine, that connects us to what we have been created for. It connects us to the cycle of the moon, of the sun, of the planets. It connects us to the seasons, no matter what your geographical location. If you look at the essence of creation, you will see that at the level of the atom, which is said to be the smallest part of creation, so everything in this masjid is made of atoms, even our body. There's a certain pattern. In the middle you have the nucleus, and around the nucleus you have a rotation of electrons and protons in an anti-clockwise position. So there's a pattern at a micro level. When atoms come together, it forms cells. If you look at certain cells, we see there's a movement in an anti-clockwise position. When cells come together, they form tissues which form organs. If you look at the human body, we will see that the blood circulation system moves in an anti-clockwise position perfectly. So at the micro level, there's a design. At the macro level, there's a design. On the very planet that we are living, the Earth. The, rot the Earth rotates on its own axis, axis in an anti-clockwise position. In our solar system, all the planets rotate around the sun in an anti-clockwise position. And it is said that galaxies move in the same direction. So at the micro level, there's a design that Allah has ordained. At the macro level, there's a design that Allah has ordained. And it all follows a certain pattern. And our acts of Ibadah follow that same pattern. So when we perform the act of Tawaf around that Kaaba, we are mimicking an act that is happening within our bodies at the micro level, on the earth that is moving in that same direction. Therefore, we find ourselves in a state of ecstasy or bewilderment or a, a, a feeling that we cannot explain because for the first time in our lives we are doing what we have been designed to do at every level. Every cell is doing it in our body, our heart is doing it, the earth is doing it and now we are moving in that direction. Therefore every part of our body rece receives holistic medicine. And this is what Tiba Nabawi is. It connects the human being to the natural design. We have been created on a fitra, and Tiba Nabawi connects us to that fitra. It tells us that this world has benefit and harm. And the harm is placed on us without us knowing. But when we connect to the sunan, automatically we are taken out of that harm. But we have to have a better perception of the sunan. And when we have a better perception, our body is open to accept that healing. So Tiba Nabawi is fulfilling the fitrah. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. If it's time for questions, I will take the written questions. The question is, is there any harm in sleeping immediately after eating? Okay. The question is like, what happens if you eat yourself in a coma? That's the question. Okay, basically, when we sleep, the body uses energy for digestion, but it does not use the same amount of energy as we would use when we awake. So if you sleep, if you consume a huge meal and you go sleep, you have a high calorie intake without the consumption. 
So it is harmful in that it will cause a heavy burden on the digestive process. But over time, the body can become used to it because the body adapts to whatever we do to the body. But that adaptation is harmful. So it would be best to abstain from eating about two hours before sleeping. But for some of us, we can only sleep if we eat liquor. <laughs> so what we should do is, it's going to be too harsh to not eat liquor all of a sudden. Because the thing is, the Tibanabu also teaches us that the nafs doesn't like to be restrained completely. So we have to, we have to con the nafs. So basically, one morsel of food less a, a day. So instead of the whole Gatsby, three quarter tomorrow night. And so basically, start to slow down one bit at a time. Instead of saying, okay, tonight I'm not going to eat. And you starve in the middle of the night, you wake up three o'clock, and that kitchen is your, your bedroom. So rather, aim towards having minimal amount of, to have a light snack before you sleep is fine, but to have a heavy acne, biryani, it's, it's, it's heavy on the body. But like I said, some of us are used to it. So what's also very good is next week we're doing um, Sunnah nutrition. And we'll see how the Sunnah can actually um, bring out dietary habits into check. But it is a difficult one. One thing is the, the most hardest thing to change is our diets. Because it's connect, connected to our emotions. If we eat liquor, we're happy. If we don't, we're not happy. Uh, what's it? A hungry, a hungry man is an angry man. So, we're going to speak about that next week. Okay, the question is, um, so what happens if we don't drink water and we only drink tea and coffee? Um, basically, the best drink, according to the Sunnah, is water. And scientifically, the best drink is water. Water is needed for every part of the body. Without water... The cells in the body cannot communicate. The processes cannot happen efficiently. So tea and coffee is like third grade water, not even second best. So within tea and coffee, you get, you get teas that are herbal, but there's also a lot of preservatives in some teas. So for every cup of tea, you might need two cups of water to cleanse that tea out. But I'm not saying give up on your tea. I'm saying ensure that you have more water than tea in your day. So if you light your five cups of tea a day, have three cups and have two cups of water. If you want to ensure that you're having a, a good amount of water a day, whatever you will do, have a glass of water. That would be a good intake. But also understand that we obtain water from food, so when we eat, there's water that's extracted from food. So too much water can also be a bad thing. So don't overhydrate. But understand there is no better fluid than water. And one of the worst fluids to drink would be gas drinks because it, it is, there's too much uh, uh, preservatives in there and colorants. So ease off the gas drinks also by diluting it. If you're giving it to children, it's very bad for them. Dilute it. If you're giving pure juices to children, also it's too sweet for them unless you're making homemade juices. So what we want to do is we want to align ourselves as close to the sunnah as possible without being too harsh on ourselves. So ideally, try to ensure that the best drink or the, the most that you're drinking is water in the day. The question is, is there a place for energy healing in Islam? Definitely there is. Uh, there's different healing systems around the world. And in order to answer this question, we have to look at our pious predecessors. What was their method of extracting knowledge? So when Islam spread beyond the Arab borders, Muslims came across ways of life much different to their own. So they looked at different forms of healing. And wherever they saw benefit, they took out that benefit. And wherever there was something that went against Tawheed, they threw that out. But they never threw the knowledge away because of that contamination. They basically threw that out because the belief is that all knowledge is the lost property of believers. Wisdom is the lost property of the mu'min. So you can take knowledge from anyone on the condition that you know your aqidah is in check and it doesn't contravene your the tawheed. So some energy healers would say that healing takes place through me and the which according to Islam is not far-fetched because Allah used people for healing. 
but when you are considered to be the healer, that's a big problem. So you could take energy healing from somebody, but the way you apply it within the framework of Islam becomes permissible. Because we find the Sahaba used different forms of healing that was practiced by the polytheists, the people that, that, that you know, practice shirk. But the medicine, there was benefit in certain parts and they took the medicine only. So that comes with, so therefore Tiba Nabu embraces any method of healing that does not contravene our Qaeda. What book is recommended to purchase as a reference for prophetic healing? The best books would be the books of Ibn Taymiyyah al jawziyah and Jalaluddin as Asiyuti, which is entitled Medicine of the Prophet. However, the jargon used in there is very difficult to understand. So you could take some recommendations. So to, to obtain the modern versions of it, like Islamic medicine written by modern scholars, is better. However, the modern scholars would focus on one food item and the medicinal value of it. So the philosophy of Tiba Nabi doesn't carry through. So the, what, I'm, what I'm gonna try to do is to try to bridge the two together. Get the philosophy of Tiba Nabi in a modern, that, that's what this class is actually about. So we find that a lot of modern day scholars are writing benefits of honey and dates, and, but in isolation. But connected to that is an understanding on how to use it according to the body because the Prophet also wants to use food according to qualities. Dates is heating. So in certain circumstances, too much dates can overheat the body. But dates in itself is very good. But certain people shouldn't have too much dates. So we'll talk about that also in the future. The question is, if you add normal water to Zamzam water, will the Zamzam water lose its good properties? How can you preserve Zamzam water? So basically the concept is simple that good can be multiplied. So therefore we find if you mix Zamzam water with different water, the Baraka of Zamzam water can spread. So Baraka is a different, a difficult thing to, 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 to talk about because it can be done with something small but it can have massive effects. Like the ulama, they, 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 they did something small but it's still with us today. They considered it small, it's still with us today. Um, someone spread a good word to somebody, they pass it on. So the concept of, of, of changing the energetics of something is very real in Islam. That barakah can be transferred to something and it can maximize. Okay, that's, I think that's all the questions for this week. One question is elaborate more on olive and fig. We'll do so next week. How bad is energy drinks to your body on a daily basis? It depends on the person. <laughs> Our bodies are all different. We can tolerate different things. If we are seeking to gain energy from the energy drinks, we're looking in the wrong place. Marketing and labeling makes us believe that that drink is going to give us energy. It's just loaded with sugar. So you might have an energy spike for that five minutes, but the effect that it has on your body is detrimental because you're going to have an energy low, a dip that is more negative than, the, than the, the positive aspects. So the harms outweigh the benefits. We'll speak about energy levels and we'll speak how important the correct consumption of food, the correct consumption of food at the right time, in the right manner, can improve your energy levels. So we'll leave that for next week, inshallah. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين